So, hello and welcome to Setting Up an Art Space in Moreland. This is the eighth and final in our Making It in Moreland series for 2020, presented by Arts Moreland. Uh, my name is Angela Panic and I'm the Arts Officer here at Moreland City Council. Um, uh, visual description, I am a uh, middle-aged, <laughs> when did that happen, white woman, um, sort of uh, cut dark hair with uh, blonde tips, wearing a grey jumper, in a room with a window behind me and a white blind. Um, I'd firstly like to take this opportunity to acknowledge the traditional custodians on the land on which we meet today in our various locations around Australia. I'm currently on the land of the Wurundjeri Woiwurrung and Wurundjeri peoples of the Kulin Nation, and I pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. I'd also like to extend that respect to other First Nations people who are present here today from other parts of the world. I acknowledge and deeply respect your cultural heritage, your beliefs, and your continued relationship with the land, and acknowledge that Aboriginal sovereignty was never ceded here in Australia. So welcome. Making It in Moreland is an annual series of free professional development workshops and discussions for our local artists and creatives. Facilitated by experts, this year's weekly events have focused on ways artists and makers can survive, adapt and recover from the impact of COVID-19. Today we'll be discussing how to set up an art space and that includes navigating planning regulations, securing grants and funding, exploring different operational models, finding the right space and how to keep on keeping on during this unusual time. You'll be hearing from Moreland's Arts Infrastructure Officer, Ed Service, and our guest Moreland artists, Aaron Billing from Pink Ember Studio, and Brian Galligan and Erin Crouch from TCB Art. As well as being Moreland Council's Arts Infrastructure Officer, Ed is a musician, an artist, and an urban planning scholar, and on the tenancy mix and community management at the Collingwood Arts Precinct. Ed is also a member of the Yarra Arts Advisory Council, the Yarra Room to Create panel, and is co-director of Peel Street Festival. Aaron, who you'll be hearing from after uh, shortly, is a textile and comic artist working out of Pink Ember Studio in Coburg. His work has been exhibited through Blindside RAI, Teen Street Presents, and Trocadero Art Space, amongst others. He graduated with honours in fine art from Monash University in 2019, and he's currently the gallery manager and the studio manager at Pink Ember Studio. Pink Ember is a not-for-profit queer run art space providing studio spaces, a shop front, workshops and exhibition spaces. Pink Ember is focused on creating a space for community engagement and has received arts investment grant funding from Moreland Council to expand its reach with new infrastructure and new cultural programs. After Eric, we'll be hearing from Bryony Gallagher and Erin Crouch, who are both artists and board members of TCB Art Incorporated. Bryony joined TCB in 2007, uh, sorry, 2017, and Erin joined in 2018, after each had exhibitions at the space. TCB Art Inc. is an artist-run gallery dedicated to providing a space where young, emerging and established artists alike have the artistic freedom to explore, experiment and take risks within their own practice. Through several locational shifts and an evolving collective of committee members and volunteer sitters, TCB has remained dedicated to providing a platform and support for emerging artists and curators, whilst continuing to run independently. TCB recently completed an ambitious renovation of their building with support from all the City Council's Arts Infrastructure Grant. So please make all of our speakers welcome and I'll now hand you over to our Arts Infrastructure Officer, Ed Service. Thanks, Ed. Thanks, Ange. And thank you very much, everyone, for joining us today. I'm just going to open up my presentation and try and share my screen. I hope that works. Can anyone confirm that you can see my screen? I can't see the chat at the moment. so. I'll yes, think. we can see it. But if you want to just start the presentation, Ed, and then you'll actually see the full page. Yeah. Um, Second. If you just press slideshow, it should go into what you That works, yeah? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, thanks everyone for joining us. And I'm especially uh, grateful to be joined for, uh, by our friends from uh, TCB and Pink Ember Studios. Um, you know, the arts infrastructure and arts landscape in Moorland, I mean, Moorland and 
Moorland, as you can see by this little map from our arts infrastructure plan on the right, is uh, one of the richest, most fruitful art cities in Australia, really. And all that comes down to the individual artists and the people that set up the spaces, take the leap of faith and put it all on the line to, to create art. And Council was very aware that we can play a role at supporting and cultivating this, but we're also very aware that this um, this is all about you. And we're very grateful for that and we're keen to help out where we can. So that's hence why I'm, we're lucky to be joined by uh, TCB and Pen Camber and very grateful for their time. And my understanding, of my way of looking at this is that most of our learnings are gonna come from them. Um, I'm sure my presentation will be largely redundant by the time they're finished, but, um, we'll let them go through their presentations and then I'll wrap up at the end and we can look at a number of ways that council um, can hopefully support you through a process of thinking about setting up an art space or finding an art space in Moland. Um, as Anne said, my role is as the arts infrastructure officer in Moland. Um, and that role was created a couple of years ago in response to the arts infrastructure plan, which is online um, and worth reading. Um, and essentially my role is about supporting art space in Moorland and supporting people looking to set up an art space or find an art space and overall try and influence the direction within council to involve the arts in civic infrastructure works and also in planning developments and planning outcomes. Um, my experience, I'm from New Zealand, I'm a musician and artist and have worked in the arts since moving to Melbourne. And when I moved to Melbourne, I moved into a, a artist warehouse in Brunswick, which is now a uh, massive apartment development on Albert Street. I used to pay 50 bucks a week rent and people had studios and living quarters in this big warehouse. I wasn't aware of any of the planning considerations at the time, but as uh, Brunswick and Mond have gentrified significantly, spaces is becoming more expensive and Obviously, artists are getting pushed out for the, to the north, so we, we do recognise that as a council and we are trying to come up with strategies to assist that. The Arts Infrastructure Plan is, I guess, the first step in, in trying to keep the keep affordable art space in Moorland. Um, I, towards the end of, sorry, a few years ago, I completed my Masters of Urban Planning degree to try and understand this, and therefore I kind of straddle across planning and the arts. And um, my role at Moorland is essentially to be that conduit to help to translate planning uh, information to arts, arts workers, people looking to set up art spaces and artists and help them to understand, jump through the hoops at council. So basically any questions you've got any time about anything to do with planning, council, buildings, I may or may not be able to answer your question, but you can ask me anything and hopefully I can at least point you in the right direction. Um, so yeah, my experience is largely from an institutional background, working at the Collingwood Arts Precinct and working at council, but we all know that this stuff happens at the ground level, um, where people like TCB and Emper, TCB and Pink Ember um, set it up through their hard work, blood, sweat and tears. Um, so to speak to that, I'll be like to hand over to Aaron from Pink Ember Studios, who will tell us a bit about their story and some of the lessons that they've learned along the way. Um, Pink Ember is a great studio up in Coburg North, and I'll let Aaron tell you a bit about their story. Hello, hey, um, thanks, Ed. Um, no um, so <laughs> I have a presentation too that I might just put up straight away. Oh, that's not the start. Um, and then I've got it. Shoot. Okay. Um, hello. Um, I'm Aaron. Um, and as a visual description, um, uh, I'm wearing a pink jumper. Um, I'm wearing a blue hat. I'm in a room that is mostly white and have a bookshelf um, to my right and 
some posters on the wall and some embroidery. Um, yeah, I'm a 32 year old white male with a curly mullet. <laughs> Strange to have to confront that. Um, <laughs> um, okay, so um, yeah, I am the, the, uh, the gallery director and a studio manager at Pink Ember Studios. Um, Pink Ember Studio is on O'Hay Street in Coburg North. And we have existed now for um, two and a half years. Um, so this is our team. Um, we are a not-for-profit ARI or Artist Run Initiative with four board members, um, Aoife Billings, who's my sister, um, Francis Cannon, and uh, Gemma Flack, and myself. And that's my dog, Spooky, as well. You can see her. Um, all right. Um, what are we? Well, I've already given you a little bit of a description of what we are, but that doesn't really fully cover it. We are lots of things. We are a shop um, where we provide um, artists in our, who have studios with us and also local um, Melbourne artists with a space to sell their handmade um, art. Um, we offer them a 20% commission, which is um, really good. <laughs> um, part of Part of why we set up Pink Ember was to uh, do things differently than how a lot of artists are treated. A lot of art spaces will charge 60% commission for stocking in like an artist shop. Um, and we wanted to try to create an alternative to that. Um, we are also a workshop space. So before COVID, we um, hosted workshops in our physical space within the shop space. Um, and we would have um, regular embroidery circles. Um, we did life drawing, as you can see here. Um, we also ran workshops um, on screen printing, um, mending, um, drawing comics, comics drawing. Um, we've moved a lot of them online now. Um, but yeah, that was definitely part of the purpose of the space as well to was to create a, I guess, like a welcoming and engaging environment for the public to come and meet artists and, um, sh and artists could share their skills with people. Um, we we're also an exhibition and performance space. So this is an example of um, Eloise Grills doing a zine reading at one of our um, zine reading events. And yeah, so now I've just got a few um, tips for um, setting up an ARI and some things I guess like that I wish I knew now with hindsight. Um, hopefully I, I can pass on a little bit of, of wisdom hard one wisdom. Um, all right, so the most important things I would say are um, establishing trusting relationships with the people you're working with. Um, and that can obviously be, um, you know, you know the people that you're working with before you set up the RI, or you can create a mutual agreement that you can all sign that makes um, everyone accountable to each other and gets you sort of on the same page, um, which is sort of goes to my second point of having shared goals. Um, writing a statement of what you want the space to be, um, possibly even like a manifesto, if you want to go down that road, um, or at least some sort of uh, very clear bio that you can put on your website where everyone can agree that that's what the space is 
Um, that's what its reason for being is. Um, for us, we wanted to create a, a queer art space that was like queer run um, because we felt like that wasn't really something that was available um, in our area. And we wanted to create a space where um, low income and emerging artists could make money out of their work and not be so exploited. So that was our shared goals. Um, and yeah, I think also a good thing to have is experience with the structure of an ARI. Um, so I'd done a little bit of volunteer work with um, Trocadero um, and our bookkeeper, Gemma Flack, had been working with Sticky Institute for years before this. And those were all very valuable um, experiences to take into uh, this uh, project where we were fairly, uh, I guess, sort of, you know, out on the water. Like we, we didn't really know what we were doing, but having that experience, at least knowing what an ARI is and like having an idea of, you know, how that structure exists was very beneficial. Um, here are a list of some ARIs um, that I would recommend volunteering for. Um, I'm not sure what kind of projects these ARIs are doing right now. And obviously everything's very different in the pandemic, but um, mostly uh, all of these ARIs are always looking for people to volunteer and help them. Um, uh, defining your roles is another very important thing to do when you're setting up an ARI. Um, every collective will have different roles, obviously. Um, once you have to find your roles, you want to create a partnership agreement. And this is very important. Um, so you might set up your uh, collective as like a not-for-profit, um, which is what we did. And that actually requires a partnership agreement to get the paperwork done for that. So it's a good idea to have that done anyway. Um, uh, so in terms of defining roles, for example, I'm the gallery manager and the studio manager, which means that I take care of all the emails that come in around people wanting studio spaces. And I also organize um, events and fundraisers and uh, gallery shows. And, you know, uh, Aoife is our workshop manager. So she answers all the emails about workshops. Um, Gemma is our bookkeeper. Um, very, very lucky to have them. Um, so they handle uh, the bills and the sales um, and the expenses. And then Francis Cannon is our um, shop manager. So they answer all the emails about the shop. They process stock. Um, so it's really good having those very clearly defined roles. Um, makes everything less complicated. And, you know, especially when you've got four people answering emails. Um, makes, uh, makes sure nothing, you know, just gets uh, left behind um, and everything gets done a bit more. Uh, smoothly. So I would say like some people use um, management software, um, but we just have a system where we label emails and it's been really good for us. Um, so I just thought I'd share that. <laughs> um, so everyone probably knows how to do this already, but if you don't, it's really great. Um, <laughs> I only realized this when we set up the ARI that this was possible. Um, so, you know, this email, for example, is an email about a zero invoice. So that's like, um, we want, I want Gemma to look at that one. So you just go to labels and then you set up these pre-existing labels and then you just tick them. And then the person who, whose role it is to look at those emails can easily find them. And that's been really, really beneficial. Um, another thing I would say is very important is choosing a location. 
Um, and that would really depend on what kind of ARI you want to set up, like what you want to produce there. I know there's some ARIs that do like uh, woodworking and more messy work. Um, we are more of a kind of sewing, um, drawing, painting workshop. So we, um, when we found this location, it was really perfect for us. Um, and the way that we found it was um, we were looking on Sydney Road, like closer to Sydney Road. We really wanted to be sort of in that area. Um, but we went to a couple of inspections and they were very, very expensive. Um, so we just sort of started just walking the streets that we liked and sort of seeing if there was abandoned buildings and then contacting um, the people because you can look up an address on Google and you can often find who owns it. Um, and we were emailing people um, who owned these abandoned buildings. We emailed the person who, who owned this building and it turned out that they were renovating the building and they were looking to lease it um, within like two months. Um, and so we were able to sort of have a very uh, early conversation with them, expressing our interest, telling them who we were. Um, and they really liked the idea of, of, ha of hosting a um, ARI. Because um, um, I think it could be quite, quite good for a landlord or quite, quite good for a community to have an ARI. Um, so, you know, it's, it's always good to, uh, you know, contact people, tell them who you are, and they might, you know, be able to offer you some discounts. We were able to get about a 20% discount for the first year, which was great. Um, also some things you want to look out for, I suppose, is yes, accessibility, transport and safety. So something that was very important for us is that we wanted to have um, a studio that was accessible, like wheelchair access, um, and we have that on the ground floor. We also do have the upstairs, which is not accessible, but um, at least we have an area where we can host public um, events that is fully accessible. Um, all right, things I wish I knew. Um, as I said, defining our roles, splitting the workload, um, very, very important. I also wish that uh, we had created studio contracts and studio welcome packs and a Google Drive spreadsheet with all the studio members mapped out on it. Um, these are the things that we ended up making, I think about like maybe two or three months in. If we had them set up at the start, it would have been way easier. And so this is an example of the studio members map. So it's very easy to do. We just did it on, you know, a Google uh, spreadsheet. Made a world of difference, especially for me as the studio manager. All right, and just um, just wanted to talk about how we've handled this year just to finish up. Um, so this year we have not really been open as a physical store, um, but we've been trying to do other things like we've been creating window displays and uh, still selling um, artists work through the window displays through like a, a email contact um, situation. Uh, we've also been able to offer um, pay as you feel online workshops. And this is through assistance um, with Moreland Council, which has been really helpful. We've been able to redirect our um, infrastructure grant funding into paying artists to host workshops. Um, and then um, just requesting donations from the public. So some people can pay, you know, $5 or nothing if they, if they don't have the money. Some people have been able to pay a lot more and yeah, that's been really great.
it's been you know a way to keep in contact with our community and support the artists who have studios with us by being able to pay them money to um you know host workshops um we've also collaborated with um, a Sydney-based artist, Sam Layton Daw, to create an online um, Instagram-based exhibition platform where um, every month one of us um, curates a show. Um, and so this is an example of um, the show that I curated, the one with the, uh, the pink squares around it. And yeah, it's been a really, that's been, you know, it's not as good as coming together and all sharing um, art together, but it has been a, a kind of a good substitute for it. Um, we try to encourage artists to write a statement about their work and then people to sort of comment on them in the comment section. Um, and we've also been able to raise a lot of money for artists. Um, all of our shows have been sold out which has been incredible. Um, yeah, so this is, uh, that's us. Um, you can find us at pinkemberstudio.com. And uh, yeah, I'm not sure when we will be back as a physical store, um, but we have online workshops and we have an online store. And yeah, um, thank you very, very much. Thanks, Aaron. Clap, 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 clap. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, that's awesome. And yeah, congratulations on selling out the shows. That's amazing, particularly for online. Oh, that's, yeah, that's all we're all about, making money for artists. Well, on that note, um, one of the questions that came through from Roberta uh, mm -hmm. was asking, um, what well, is a few questions here? Uh, how did you find artists whom you want to show their arts, volunteer, collaborate with, and I guess give studios as well was the first question. Oh, um, so the artists that I, um, like obviously the artists that we set up the collective with, um, one of them is my sister. So we've been collaborating for a long time. Um, Frances, I was in a previous studio with her um, on Cousin Street. Um, and Gemma, we knew from their work with um, Sticky Institute and we knew that they were a bookkeeper. So we contacted them um, because we wanted to, you know, see if they could help us with some of the things that we were not great at. Um, in terms of the artists who have studios with us, uh, we have an application process that people go through. Um, we prioritize queer and femme artists. Um, and we, um, we offer um, uh, discounted rates um, for indigenous artists. Um, but it's mostly just like what, what the applications we get, we try to, uh, you know, go over them make sure that they're someone who wants to be part of the community, who wants to help out with the fundraisers and the shop. Um, I guess what we're looking for is people who are, want to be social and active within the community. But other than that, it's really just, yeah, just going through the applications and seeing who's, who's going to fit with our ethics and. Yeah. Um, and follow-up questions from that is, is this your main job and how do you make money? Oh, um, no, so this is not my main job. I don't make any money out of this. <laughs> um, I do make money through it um, kind of tangentially by selling my own work in the shop um, and hosting workshops that I can pay myself to do through the collective fund. But mostly I work as a illustrator um, and a, a tattoo designer, I make quilts that I sell. Um, I also sell paintings um, and I work in a retail store as well. Um, yeah, and I do design work and I do other workshops with other councils 
I have a lot of jobs. <laughs> right, and and so as in, well, a couple questions about the non for profit um, aspect. Mm -hmm. Is that difficult to set up? Um, did you find, how was how did you find that process? Pretty straightforward, or it's pretty straightforward. It's actually um, very easy to set up. It's it's easier the tax returns that you do and the sort of records that you need to keep are um, easier than if you are a for-profit business. Um, and you can also, you know, you can also get a lot of um, financial help. Great. It's good. And, um, as a non-for-profit, does that essentially mean that all your income from your studios and commissions, et cetera, are meant to roughly add up to the operating cost of the business and you break even? Um, that's pretty much it. Yeah. So we charge rent for the studios. We charge a, a little bit more than, um, what the, um, actual cost is just to cover, um, some people maybe having vacant studios. Um, but all of that money goes into a collective fund, which we use to, yeah, cover expenses like council rates, um, elect electricity and water, um, and also to buy things for the collective, um, such as projectors, um, screens, um, and um, sometimes if we have excess money left over, we'll um, put that into uh, like a fund to support um, like, artists from the collective to run their own workshops so we can pay them to run workshops. Cool. Um, and the other question that I had done to, to ask one more thing was, um, oh, the contracts that you spoke of and the like license or contract agreements that you have with these studio artists, um, where did you source them from or how did you write them up eventually when you got them? Okay. So, um, Gemma, a bookkeeper, um, wrote them up, um, and I'm pretty sure they they got a lot of the um, uh, the I guess what the the rules and regulations from uh, oh, there's some website that gives you a lot of information about how to run a cooperative, um, yeah. and the sort of uh, structures to put in place. I can't remember what that website is, but if you look up how to run a cooperative, I I think it will come up. It's a government website. Um, so we got most of our things from there and then we just sort of tweaked it from there, like to make it more specific to what we were doing. Cool. You don't, you don't have to write it from scratch. Yeah. Um, great. Thanks very much. Oh, one qu question from Kelsey Pringle, who's asking if, do you know of an Ari that has a kiln for firing ceramics? Oh, we were going to have one. We, this year we were going to um, invest in one. Um, so we could have been that ARI. Um, I, don't, I don't know of one off the top of my head. Um, yeah, I can, um, perhaps we can put that question to the whole attendees and panel, if anyone knows of Ari with a, um, a kiln. If uh, not, Kelsey, you feel free to email me after this. I definitely know some people with kilns and artists with kilns around that um, would be keen to help out. Mm -hmm. um, and could you just speak a bit about the grants that you've got through either Moreland or, um, or Creative Victoria or anyone like that? Yeah, so we've been really lucky to receive um, funding from Moreland Council um, two years in a row um, for infrastructure, the infrastructure grants program. Um, the first uh, grant that we got, we used to uh, create uh, uh, shop fittings for the store and to um, uh, build some things for the studio. Um, we did them, we got our, our stuff built uh, by um, Andrew from Brunswick West Workshop, which was great. So we were able to support another local uh, ARI business. Um, uh, yeah, and then the second one is the one that we are currently using and uh, yet to acquit. Um, we have been able to create these um, online workshops where people can pay as they feel. 
-hmm. Yeah, we've applied for a few uh, Creative Victoria um, uh, grants, but we haven't we haven't been, uh, been successful in any of those. We've only got the two um, Moreland ones, which we, you know, thankful for any grants we can get. Yeah, I guess um, perseverance is the key eh? uh, with Creative Vic often. From my yeah. Um, great. Well, uh, we'll have a little bit to tell people about grants at the end of this and hopefully some good news coming out in the next few months. Um, but Aaron, thank you very much. And there's a large round of applause going around on all the muted, uh, all the muted <laughs> attendees with us now. Uh, and we'll have some time for more questions for Aaron and the whole panel um, later on. Um, but now it would be great to uh, turn to Bryony and Aaron. Um, from TCB Gallery who are going to tell us their story. Thank you. Um, thank you. Um, I thought we um, might start by talking about why we joined the board. Um, so I joined the board in um, the TCB board in 2018 um, and it was really um, it was really great after I finished uh, studying at uni to kind of to be a part of a community um, and also to kind of think about um, sharing ideas and um, showing art kind of independently outside of those institutions. Um, Bryony, when did you join the board? Hi everyone. Um, I just thought I'd start, I'll just explain briefly. Um, my back. So I'm a, um, just to give you a sense of where I am. I'm a, a white woman in earrings wearing red lipstick just with a plain, um, a mushroom coloured wall behind me in a bookshelf. Um, I joined TCB in 2017 um, and like many of the board members, we're actually all artists. Um, some boards have, you know, they'll get lawyers or uh, uh, accountants, people who can uh, offer them those kinds of skills, but TCB is really into having kind of a diversity of art practices and people um, involved. Um, so I joined after showing a couple of years after I showed in the space. Um, and I think you had a show at TCB before you joined as well, didn't you, Erin? Uh, yes, in 2017, um, just before we left Waratah Place. Yeah. yeah. And I think, I don't know, that seems something that's really interesting about TCB, like to have that everyone who's involved in the space has also showed at some point in the space or curated a show or put together kind of a program. Um, it, it revolves around that kind of give and take of being able to facilitate other projects as well as being able to, um, usually it's come through people volunteering at the space or um, showing their own work at the space. Yeah, quite a few of the board members have volunteered before they joined the board. Um, and that's always been really, really good, a really, yeah, a nice kind of way through. Um, and Erin, can you tell me a little bit about the history of TCB? Because it's been around for 25 years, but we're quite new to Moland. Yeah. Um, yeah, it was established in 1998 um, by artists Blair Trithowen, Sharon Goodwill, uh, sorry, Goodwin, and um, Thomas Deverell. Um, and so it started off in the Port Phillip Arcade in Melbourne as a tiny little kind of shop front um, that was a gallery. And then uh, in 2001, I think, it moved to Waratah Place um, and sat beside, behind Uplands Gallery, which was a commercial gallery. Um, so it was just in one sort of small room. And then in 2003, um, Uplands moved out and TCB took over the whole space um, and was there until 2018. Um, so I had a really long history there. Um, I just had a couple of studios up the top, um, which I think helped subsidise the rent. Yeah, um, I'm, I'm just going to go to a couple of photos of the old, shows in the old TCB. Old yeah. Yeah. Um, so it, it hosted a huge amount of shows there and has always been completely volunteer run and um, mostly run by artists. I think occasionally there have been curators or arts administrators on the board, but for the majority it's been, um, it's been artist run. Um, 
And so then I guess in the last couple of years, we've had this like big move to uh, Moreland where we started the new space March last year. Um, and you joined the board actually when TCB didn't have a space. Yeah. Yeah. So um, it was when we were looking for a space. So I think by that stage, the board was quite small and um, we were trying to decide or the board was trying to decide um, trying to find a new accessible space and, and kind of trying to reimagine what the new TCB would be. Um, so I think, Bryony, was it about two years or a year and a half you were looking for a space? We were looking for a space. Yeah, so basically we were kind of priced out of the CBD of, of Waratah Place. Our landlord doubled our rent overnight. Um, and it also became, I guess, kind of an opportunity. The old space was up three flights of stairs. Um, became an opportunity to sort of like really reimagine what it could be. Um, we'd also had a lot of the board initially, they kind of formed out of a group of friends who studied together at the VCA um, in the 90s and 2000s. And TCB, it's, it's sort of, um, I guess it's kind of come to the end of that, of like how to get new people involved, how to change it. So it seemed like a good moment actually to be able to move the space and address um, how to make the space different, how to get kind of fresh ideas and energy and um, different people involved. And we came, we ended up in Moreland, we were looking at heaps of different spaces. And the problem with affordable space is it's often actually up a flight of stairs with no chance of a lift. Um, one of the things about artist run spaces and funding is there's not yet the kind of same sorts of um, state infrastructure here that are elsewhere in terms of accessibility. Um, it's quite limited to get funding to make a space or retrofit a space when you're like a small organisation. But for us, it was kind of like a non-negotiable to find a space at least that wasn't um, less accessible than the last TCB. So we were looking for something that was ground floor um, and that pushed us out a little bit further, like there was nothing in the CBD. Um, but also we met um, another artist who'd set up a space called Irene Rose, um, who'd done, um, was using the same building. So one to five Wilkinson Street. And we, um, yeah, then we're able to, he was running it by himself um, and we were able to take over that, that lease. So um, we have a commercial lease that's got another, I think two or three years to run with the option to extend for another five. Um, yeah, so it was, it was really quite difficult. Um, but one of the things that we came up with during that time was that actually having a space was really important for the gallery. Um, that having a space where we could open it and use it as a resource for other artists and let artists determine what they wanted to show, um, what agenda they wanted to push, what they wanted to speak about, was something that is quite political in this time where space is um, in big cities is really kind of compromised. Um, yeah, but also I think, I don't know, it's been interesting too, because we, I guess TCB has had this maybe kind of like ill-defined sort of idea of being like independent till we die. And I know we had a lot of discussions with the group, um, yeah, about what that actually means, um, as a artist run space. I know for me, um, I think we've seen like a trend in, um, the arts over probably the last 10 or 15 years of professionalising art spaces. But basically, I think being really critical of that as artists of um, effectively, I think what that means is like administrators, producers, curators, like the kind of art industry still doesn't pay artists a living wage. Um, so some of it, I think, is around making decisions that prioritise the programming or the art or the community around the art rather than professional structures that, you know, professionalising, if it doesn't lead to kind of like, um, yeah, I guess like a changed material or economic circumstance, it's like, what's the point in professionalising? Just show interesting work or run it for other reasons, I guess. I don't know, what do you, what do you think about that idea of independent till we die? Um, I feel like it's, it's, it's sort of changed. It changes a lot, um, what, what, it, what it means and, and what's important about it. Um, and yeah, it's, it's an ongoing discussion as to why that independence is important. I think it, 
it was really important when we were looking for a new space um, that TCB um, determined what it was or it sort of, it had that independence um, and it wasn't sitting um, in something else, um, if that makes sense. Um, and so I think, yeah, that was kind of as we were looking for a space and we found this and then I know we kind of readdressed and said, well, what does independence mean? Um, especially if we're receiving funding or, you know, and, and I think at the moment, I feel like for the board, the independence is uh, really important in relation to our programming and that we have, that we have, um, that we can program the art that we want to program. Um, yeah, I feel like that's, yeah. that's what it means for me at the moment. Yeah. I also think maybe it's like the, there's been like a big shift in artist run structures um, mm -hmm. in the last kind of particularly 10 years of in the past in our city, like artists used to pay to show work. And now that, um, yeah, that's, I guess it's never been a sustainable model. Um, and so one of the things that TCB has been looking at is also to get income from different streams that aren't artists. Um, so we license part of our building now. Um, we've, we've just done a bit of a rental on the building, but we're licensing some of it to a commercial business. Um, we try and get grants from diverse sources. But I think this also this philosophy of like independence um, or volunteering or something like, I feel like it's about being part of a kind of community and all of us, I think so many of us at TCB like kind of similar to Aaron. I mean, that's the tricky thing about art, but also I think some of the other things where you're like, well, what other value does it have? Yeah, we're all generating income, not through <laughs> the space, obviously, because it's not for profit community organization, but just, yeah, I think that actually, if you're kind of owning that and then setting it up for other reasons, there's like huge potential in that. Mm. Um, this brings me to my next point, which was like kind of interesting actually seeing like Aaron's very detailed presentation, which was great about like things they'd wish they'd done when they set up like the welcome packs and Google docs, um, info for studio tenants is like, do you think there's benefit in setting up something kind of with energy and commitment, but maybe not knowing all the detail? Or do you think that's like a kind of rookie, there's some like rookie mistakes there? <laughs> I feel like we had no uh, idea on what it took to um, sign a commercial lease. Um, TCB was um, for a long time incorporated only by name, not, by, not legally. <laughs> 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 which I only found out by like digging through the archive, you know, like and then calling people and just like trying to figure out the paper trail. And it's like, oh no, I think for a long time TCB didn't pay the registration fee. So we just got, um, but I think with hindsight, I'm, I'm quite glad that we didn't know how big it, it was kind of huge. And I'm glad that we didn't know how huge it was um, because maybe we wouldn't, we wouldn't have, done it um, so I think just kind of jumping into it really was really helpful for us um, and not kind of getting bogged down I mean running an artist run space doesn't really make economic sense um, so um, it's kind of uh, on paper it doesn't make sense but there's somehow the energy around it and um, the, you know the, just the hard work kind of makes it work um mm. yeah yeah I think also too it's like that sense of um community and focusing on like the energy and the positive things that you want from it and what you see maybe are some of the problems or like um exclusions in the art world that you're part of um and I know moving to the new space it's been really great like one of our board members Tyson Campbell is also has like been a really important part of Black Dot and has volunteered there for kind of the last, you know, three or four years. Um, and so it's been really interesting seeing just like different conversations start to emerge or I guess we also host a, a reading um, room and bookshop um, with Amy Stewart who runs Neuromart. Um, and Amy used to be part of the board, but now runs this like amazing sort of critical theory reading space from a studio at TCB. Um, so I think some of it's also like about what are the things that are kind of generative around creative practice? How can you focus on those things? 
And then, yeah, I think some of the organisational details, um, I think, I don't know, I guess the thing that seems really important is to have really clear goals. But I know that it's been good for us to launch into really big projects like the renovation or moving to a new space. Um, yeah, it's been really, maybe we'll, we'll, we can talk a bit about the reno later, but I think it, it's kind of great that feeling of like learning as you're doing something, as long as you've got like the financial baseline covered and you know you can pay the rent that you've signed up to. Um, yeah, it seems really important to me to be able to kind of um, work it out as you go and teach each other and yeah. Well, and I also know. hustle. I feel like we've just hustled so hard. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like TCB, maybe it's uh, in part because of its its long history as well. Um, it's kind of, it's a really great vehicle to be able to do things inside of that. It's really difficult to do yourself on your own. Um, so like the projects like Amy's um, bookshop, Neuromart, um, and it can kind of just be this this vehicle to, to drive like really and the renovation like really kind of big projects um, that yeah that you can't kind of do within your own practice. Um, mm. So yeah, that's been exciting. Yeah, I guess the other thing maybe that's just a practical thing that we've also noticed is the real importance of having different funding streams. Like mm. actually, you probably need three or four funding streams. Um, and that sounds like really interesting, a different model of doing that. Like, um, yeah, listening to kind of Pink Ember. But for us, you know, we have a commercial tenant um, or commercial licensee. We have um, studios. We also have grant income from Creative Vic and from the council. We've, we have fundraisers where we sell work. Um, and we've also been um, approaching, like we have, I guess, members um, based on like a kind of triple R funding model. So where some members um, who have heaps of, you know, who are like have cash and are generous with it, they might donate a thousand dollars a year and we have other members who'll donate like 30 bucks. Um, but yeah, I think that seems super important to have different funding streams because uh, grant applications are so fickle and you just have no, um, yeah, there's kind of like really limited control in what you can secure, I think. But also I think it's kind of, um, you know, I know when TCB moved, was looking for a new space, um, we were also looking to kind of, I mean, TCB seems to have got quite big in the last two years. Um, um, but we were kind of at a point too where we, we were thinking, well, should it just get smaller? Like, should it just operate out of a garage or out of someone's house? Or, you know, like, I don't think mm -hmm. um, it has to be, it has to be really big. Um, mm -hmm. And, yeah sorry to interrupt but I guess yeah it's also that thing of prioritizing like I think always prioritizing the art you want to make and that it doesn't have to be slick um I think I see a lot of art spaces um you know they kind of then rely on like a three-year funding model or something or they're relying on funding that then overnight it just disappears but you've already spent like I don't know whatever a website costs. Whereas we're now looking at like running a website through Google Docs or um, I think there's really clever ways that you can still focus on what you want to focus on. Um, yeah. Mm. And I think, um, I know we kind of talk about this all the time, but just prioritizing the art and always trying to keep that center to what you're doing because it can, the administration and the legal stuff and all that, can can be a lot of work um and you can kind of get bogged down in it so it's like i feel like you have to always remember why we're doing it and that it, like center the art yeah totally i think that's great advice um yeah i wonder too the one of the things that it's interesting as well even just thinking about that smaller scale or the different scales I know that other spaces have been priced out of the city or priced out of a space altogether, like King's Artist Run that was in um, the city, similar thing to TCB, up three flights of stairs. Um, their rent was basically doubled overnight. Um, and so they're operating without a space, but in some ways there's also potential in that. Like it, if you operate without a space, you can spend actually more money on projects um, because you're not, working so hard to maintain that physical building 
Yeah, yeah, and I think um, there was. It's, it's, I mean, it's quite it's quite difficult to have a, a physical building. The rent is really expensive. Um, it doesn't matter where you are in Melbourne. Rent rent is expensive. Um, but I think, and I feel like especially with COVID, where uh, lots of things went online um, and lots of galleries were putting shows online and and um, I don't know, for, for me, I just, I, during that time, I, I really felt like a physical space was really important to TCB and having a gallery. Um, and even though it's difficult, it's kind of, it, yeah, I think it's really important to have shows and to have um, people in the gallery. Mm. Yeah. Totally. I think too, um, it's one of the things that an, a board member who's now a studio tenant, um, Tamsin Hopkinson, who also works at West Face, has, I think, was really, when we were moving space, was talking about how running a space is something social and political. Um, yeah, I'm just kind of interested in that, like how, um, what, what does that mean, I think, now? What, what is it important about having a space like that? Is it that sense, do you think, of like gathering people together or what, how is that different from doing an online project? Um. Well, I think for, well, I think it's it's physical um, how well how how I kind of like to experience artwork or be be in a space with with work, um, but I also th I think it's part of the community. Like it's just having the community around and meeting people and um, the energy. You know, it's kind of the energy is what keeps it going. There's no uh, none of us get paid or you know it's, it's yeah it's the kind of it's the energy around it that that's really important. Mm. Yeah. And sustains I, it. Yeah, totally. I think too, it's been interesting seeing how the, both the artists who show and also the board, like how you kind of build that energy and connection between groups and things might ebb and flow mm. and also how you address problems. Um, I think has been interesting with the group and really important um, to kind of like, change things through doing them mm -hmm. um and it, i think it's been interesting with this space too of like something that started off as like i guess a project um that came out of friends who are very similar and now i guess the tcb's evolved to where it's um we become th friends through the work i guess like the board and the volunteers and the artists but it's not um no one has a practice that's similar like there's different i guess like we're different genders and races, cultural identities, like it's quite a, um, yeah, it's a, I guess we're kind of like a really broad collective in the way that we work and like maybe we, we kind of come to um, how we run stuff. Mm. We come to the friendship later rather than as the beginning point. And I think, um... I think TCB kind of benefits from that in that it's not one person's um, vision or idea or um, it's quite layered and quite dynamic. Um, and yeah, like we never kind of know. Yeah. It just kind of, it has a life of its own. Um, yeah. It's kind of hard. You can think an idea is really great and then <laughs> it kind of just disappears or you know then you think something doesn't won't quite work and that's the thing that ends up working um yeah, mm. yeah. It's, it's, it's yeah you know. totally maybe we should brag about the renovation which Molland um city council has uh funded and which we worked with um an artist who also runs a studio space um now with Isadora Vaughan Aaron Carter um yeah who we worked with and Erin you were kind of I guess like so involved in the renovation do you want to explain a bit about what we did um yeah so um when we were looking for a new space we wanted a space that was accessible um and this was the Wilkinson Street building was the the first space that we found that um could easily be made accessible so um the doors that you're looking at at the moment, this used to be the back of the building and there were studios through those doors. Um, so Wilkinson Street was accessible, but sort of through the back door and um, it was a bit awkward. Um, and so um, we applied for an infrastructure grant um, with Moreland City Council and um, 
they generously supported this project to move their galleries to the other end of the building. Um, so for the first time ever, TCB has these two doors that open up and yeah, it's, it's really open and um, it's just a, um, a I th we think it's just a better space for artists to show work in and um, yeah. Natural light. <laughs> it's got natural light. <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah, so um, when did, uh, we kind of plan, had planned to do this work later on in the year, um, but then with being closed with COVID, um, we kind of took the opportunity to just try and get it done. Um, so, um, yeah, we put the final coat of paint on <laughs> last week and uh, it, it's sort of ready to go, although, although it's a strange time to be like carefully and slowly reopening. Um, yeah yeah so we're quite excited yeah. but i guess one of the ways we did the project on a tight budget was we worked with aaron carter to build the space but we had a team of volunteers with aaron every day doing things like prepping the walls we reused a lot of the timber and pine that was in the old space um so just like yeah pulling out nails sanding painting um I don't know. And I think, yeah, that old school kind of like working bee is really still valid. Yeah. 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 It was done through volunteer labor. <laughs> totally. Yeah. Um, yeah. Maybe that's a good place to end. I don't know if people have like questions for us or even more nitty gritty questions. Um, yeah. I've got a few nitty gritty ones and we've got a few coming through. Um, thank you very much. Another round of applause. Some really interesting questions raised there, particularly I think the one about um, you know, why is running an art space a political is running an art space a political uh, thing? Um, why is it a political thing? And I think that's a really interesting question. Perhaps we can open that up at the end. And I mean, personally, for me, personally, not official council policy, but and as an urban planning scholar and artist. I think that these spaces are inherently political because they subvert the um, standard market weird narrative of all spaces being determined as profit making entities and therefore all activities happening within these spaces are driven by profit, you know, and spaces like TCB, Pink Amber, non for profits, the when you if you can put the question of profit aside, which is really difficult, like you said, and you need all these diverse funding, funding streams what type of activities can we do in there? What type of ideas can we explore? What types of relationship and community can we develop? What type of art can we develop is a very interesting question, you know? Um, and to me, that's why I think arts infrastructure, to put it in a uh, institutional way, is uh, really important. And um, I think these, these spaces are critical to explore those types of politics. But I'll be interested to hear, you know, uh, if uh, any of our attendees have any thoughts on on that um perhaps we can chat about it later too um so yeah thanks again uh just to turn to a few questions we've got one from roberta asking <clears throat> is there any kind of education you suggest to undertake before starting this kind of collection uh, sorry collective uh more broadly like what how do you start and i guess that's a, a big question because tcb yeah, is and it kind of links to one of my questions which is uh, why is tcb so enduring you know like a 20 22 did you say 22 25 years 25 yeah yeah i mean like how did these things start and i guess i know that's a very broad question um and roberta's asking is there any education but i'd also like to ask why do you think tcb has endured um i see, well i think tcb's endured um a big part of it, I think, has been that it's completely volunteer and artist run. Um, yeah, and that, that um, I suppose um, we've been able to do a lot of things because we are volunteer run and we don't pay wages. Um, it means that we can kind of put the money back into showing art and paying artists. Um, so everything that comes in, that's where the, we try and put all our money. Um, I think it's endured because of the community around it. Um, yeah. Yeah. What do you think, Bryony? Um, yeah, I think it's endured like, um, 
also because it's run as a collective and maybe there's not, it's like a place where you can also deal with problems. So I think it's, um, yeah, I think it's, it's appealing to people because it's more about like the, the energy that the group pour into it at that time, you can really change it. It's not very bureaucratic, um, which I think puts a lot of people off being involved in artist run models. Um, yeah. If you feel like you you don't have a say in the programming or you can't, like get to the art or you can't kind of put on shows if your role is just like limited to, you know, you process the invoices, it, people won't stick around for that long. And I think at TCB, the philosophy has always been like, you kind of take these nitty gritty jobs, but everyone has a say in what gets programmed. So I think that that model is like, I think really special. And it's also kind of de-hierarchizes stuff. Like there's no director at TCB. There's no one person who has more say than anyone else. Mm. Um, it's more about what you kind of put in or the time and energy you put in. That's what you'll sort of be able to get out of it. I think that's what surprised me about TCB once I joined the board is, um, and what still excites me about it is how malleable it was. Um, you know, it can kind of like, you, yeah, you have a say and you can like, it's changeable and um, yeah, it's not, yeah. I think that's, that's been a really exciting thing. And <clears throat> Is that just to answer Roberta's question? Is there any kind of education you suggest to undertake this type of collective, or what's the best way to start? I feel like we learn we learn through doing. Mm. Oh, really, we kind of just jumped in. Um, mm. Yeah, and um, I think I learned about all the legal stuff that like how to inco like how to incorporate, how to um, the bank stuff, all of that. I just, I just sort of learnt through doing and Google. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I also think, I don't know. People. Yeah. But my advice, I guess, too, is like, because I guess I came, I came to art through a background in like art producing and art administration. So I like worked at Next Wave and Melbourne Fringe and like worked at big state institutions like the museum and the Immigration Museum. And I think my feeling is like, volunteer or do projects that are community focused where you can you have like autonomy in what you do so that could be like sitting an artist run space and sitting shows but also just ask them if you can kind of do your own project within that or have some control or something else where you get to work with other people but make up your framework because I think that always feels like super valuable and then I think in starting something yeah I just try and like gather people around you or like connect to groups that are doing cool stuff and find out if you can work with them or um, gather a group and do it yourselves would be my kind of feeling. And I would just say like, yeah, maybe prioritize if you're going to kind of do work for free, do it for um, like small organizations rather than bigger places where you'll probably get a bit lost. Cool. Thank you. Uh, Brownie, do you mind turning the screen share off? Sorry. I just saw that. No, cool. um, a question from Andrew is asking if um, you guys could talk to a problem that TCB experience ran into and how it was resolved. Maybe to help us understand like how your, your board of artists goes about, um, you know, addressing problems or the problem of should we get a space or not? How do you resolve these questions? Um, well, I think, I don't know, some of the problems in the past, I think with TCB have also been about like, probably just showing work of an in crowd um, or showing work of friends. So there's been problems with like a lack of diversity of artists. And I think you change that through changing the people that are involved in all levels of your collective. Um, so you change who's on the board, you change who you program and you change who volunteers and you try and like work with each other um, and talk to each other. But I think you kind of change it through doing it and you change it through like working with people. Great. Um, well, we best get a move on and I'll start my presentation shortly, but thank you very much, TCB. Um, I know there's another question there from Linda. Linda, maybe I'll take that question after my presentation because it kind of speaks a bit to what we're talking about. Um, and I'll bring Aaron, Bryony and Aaron online for any other questions we might have at the end. Um, cool. So I'll just share my screen. 
and find my presentation. Great. Well, um, hopefully partly what I am going to speak about today will link to what we've just heard from TCB and Pinkimba. Um, so yeah, to reiterate, I am Mourn's Arts Infrastructure Officer and my job, my role is to implement the Arts Infrastructure Plan, which is a broad, a broad range of outcomes and it's worth checking out online. It's a good read with good objectives. It's quite ambitious. Um, but the key principles of it are just here to the west on the screen. The key one I think that would relate to today's talk is about taking a proactive role in maximizing the opportunities for retention of existing art spaces and the creation of new spaces. And we'll talk a little bit about ways that I hope I can help do that today or that you can help us do that. Um, so uh, I just pulled this presentation together in the last few days. So the slide, I may be jumping between the slides, so forgive me in the, um, in the wrong order. Um, so I, I think one of the key principles to resolve early on in the process, and I think both TCB and Pink Ember spoke to this really well, was think about your vision, your mission statement, or your manifesto, essentially what's your purpose? And some, for some artist run spaces, uh, the purpose is to uh, have a free space for you to work from, uh, subsidized by others and paid for by your labor of finding the space and uh, negotiating the rents and determining their rents and, and things like that. Some people want to run a gallery. Some people want to run a collective workshop. Uh, some people want to just share space with their friends and pay an equal amount. Some people want to make a profit and a genuine income from their uh, space. And all of these are, are valid reasons to start an art space. But I think it's really important at, at the start to determine what that purposes and it could be political or it could be uh, business. Um, but some of the key questions you want to ask is uh, here, do you want to set up a space to generate a dialogue? Do you want to start a rental space to generate income? Or do you want to generate one that wants you to have a workspace for free? And there's plenty of other questions that you can ask there, but it's great to pull together a collective purpose, whether it's for yourself or for a group of uh, artists that you're bringing together and a key thing to note is that this vision and mission statement, once you lock it in, will be hopefully really useful when you're applying for grants, funding, and other sources. Um, it's great to have a few line, a few paragraphs at least to copy and paste into your grant and funding applications that give a good idea of what you're doing and why you're doing it. Um, and having this vision in place at the start will help to guide all the other decisions that you have to make, which we'll go through from here. Um, and leading in from that, you need to have a think about your business structure uh, or artists, whether they, uh, whether it seems correct or not, are regarded as sole traded for profit businesses, although many may not make much profit at all. And we do recognize that. Um, but when setting up a, a studio space or an initiative, you need to think about what type of business structure that's going to be, whether it's a non for profit cooperative like Pinkimba or um, TCB, I think, is a non-profit as well, officially. Maybe we can ask that question again later. Um, I'm not a total expert on business structures, but Council's Economic Development Team is, and they'll be super happy to run you through the implications there. So feel free to contact us to be connected with the right people there to talk through um, that. And coming with uh, the business structure is considerations of your board or committee or decision-making structures, which is, as I understand it, are a necessity of uh, non-for-profits. And if you do put together a board, you want to think about what kind of board do you want to have? Like TCB just talked about that they chose to have an all artist run board. Um, and Pink Ember, I think similarly has an all artist run board. Uh, some other organizations choose to do a broader skill matrix type board where they might have uh, like West Spaces, I understand it might have some some lawyers and philanthropists as well as artists, and they would argue that maybe this helps them in some regards to negotiating leases or figuring out legal problems or raising funds. And uh, other orgs might argue that a, an artist-run board helps them to keep focused on the art and the artists. Um, and I'm sure there's strengths and weaknesses. Either way, I'd be interested to talk about that later. But um, something you really want to consider and lock in at the start. What is your decision-making process and what is your board going to be? 
not saying that you have to have this locked in before you find a place or anything. Um, and as Brian e was saying, sometimes it can be a good process to figure these things out as you go. Um, and then we need to think about what type of space do you want to look I, what do you want your space to look like? Are, are we thinking of some studios with a gallery? Are you just looking at a gallery? Uh, what type of studios do you want? Um, are they for sculptors? Are they for painters? Should they have walls? Do the walls go to the ceiling? Or do they just go halfway? All these other types of things you need to toss up based on practice. It's, it's good to start to get an idea of how big, say 10 meters squared is. Um, so once you start checking out a few properties, it's a great question to ask the meter squareage, real estate agents love it. And it can help you to go into people's rooms and try and guesstimating roughly how big the meter squareage is and, and what would be required for your practice or your, the, your fellow artist practice. Um, roughly speaking, I would, and I, I might be wrong here, but I would say a small studio might be 15 meters squared, a large to medium studio about 25 meters squared. And, a large studio at 40 meters squared. Um, so if you look at a warehouse, say that is 200 meters squared, you might want to think about different ways you can divide that up, obviously leaving room for circulation and movement between the spaces, accessibility, etc. Do you want an event space? Maybe you want a space for events, which can be another great stream of income. Um, and roughly like I watch most non-for-profit galleries tend to do would be to add up the costs and uh, figure out the cost per meter squared of the premises, putting together extra costs such as insurance and electricity, utilities, etc., which I'll speak to in a bit, and then essentially divide the total cost by the meter squared and you are able to come up with a formula for charging studio prices. We'll speak to that in a, in a bit. But what do you want your studios to look like? And there's a lot of things to toss up and um, and it's good to talk to people that know how to build walls, for example. And as TCB just spoke about before, they would have some great contacts. So I'm sure they're great to, they're able to connect you with. It's best to go with people rather than just ringing up a, a builder. Um, it's great to go with people who have got experience building art spaces before because they often have a good understanding of budget constraints and materials and uh, for example, where there should be studs in the wall to hang works off or, or whether you um, whether you want light to come through, do you want semi-transparent uh, walls or, or fully private walls? And these are the things you need to toss up as well as um, considerations to fire ratings. For example, uh, walls that don't go to the ceiling are usually much, uh, easier because you don't need to necessarily get uh, new new reviews by fire surveyors because you're not blocking the smoke alarms and etc. So these are the types of considerations you want to think about. Um, so yeah, think about what size you want and maybe try to start sketching them into some of the floor plans you might get from your real estate agents. Um, but budgeting is an obvious one. And also just to note, a lot of these resources we've got in a publication called Four Walls, which is up on our arts infrastructure page, which is about all these things um, and where I'm taking some of these images from. It's a Moreland City Council publication supposed to help you with setting up an art space. Um, obvious things to think about are rent, electricity and water, insurance, including public liability insurance for the space and potentially building insurance, although the landlord may hold that. Um, and uh, contents insurance, whether you want to get your individual artists to insure themselves individually or you want to just put a, a insurance across everything in your building. Um, rates and other outgoings, you need to check your lease to see if your landlord's intending on, on charging rates to you and you can, you can negotiate that. Um, and I wrote management hour, but what I mean here is management hours here, whether you want to build your if it's you who's doing it, your work into setting this thing up and managing the studios from day to day, whether it's five hours a week and if you want to get paid for that um, or whether you think you can afford to charge for that. Um, and then a miscellaneous and future investment costs. So these are what you might look at as overheads and what you might want to build into your weekly, monthly per square meter rent for the artists um, that you are 
that you're leasing spaces to, assuming that you're doing a studio leasing model. The other side of more fixed costs uh, are things like the bond, the internal structures and walls, lightings, electrical fittings, and plumbing. Um, these are things that you might pay for with an investment upfront, which you could come from your savings, come from the group of artists all investing together, from crowdfunding, from other types of fundraising events, from grants, and we can talk a little bit about Morn's grants uh, in the future. And you can also look to recoup some of these, um, these fixed investments by requesting a rent-free period from your landlord. And we'll talk about negotiating at least um, uh, in, a, in a little bit. Finding the right space. Um, yeah, I, well, I, I think I got from both TCB and um, Pink Ember that they essentially got the spaces through word of mouth slash asking people the right questions. Um, best case scenario is you find another studio that's moving out and you inherit the same uh, conditions from them, which will help with zoning and et cetera and rights of use. Um, or that you find a sympathetic landlord, which uh, Pink Ember seemed to have someone that was excited by the concept of having an arts retail frontage and art space um, in their premises. But essentially, uh, not, not all good spaces are listed. Um, you want to put the word out that you're looking for a space, ask your friends, do ask real estate agents because it's their job to find the spaces and they're just as keen as you to find uh, to fill their spaces. Um, make a relationship with the real estate agents that they don't, despite common conception, they actually usually don't mind artists and arts uses and uh, they would prefer often to a mechanic who might uh, get oil all over the floor, paint's much easier to remove, you know, so don't be afraid by being an artist or an artist run space that the uh, real estate agent is going to be, it's going to be turned off. Um, and once you start looking at spaces and the addresses, um, assess it and see if it really is, you know, it might look perfect and you might have your heart set on this particular warehouse, but check it, run a planning property report and you can email me and I can assist you with that. It's, it's actually quite simple to get a good planning property report. It takes a couple minutes online and it takes a bit of clicking and a lot of bureaucratic reading, but you can get a pretty good idea of, um, of the, the status of the property and things you want to consider there is the zones, Industrial and commercial zones tend to be the main ones that are used for art spaces, but not strictly at all. Uh, the prescribed uses and overlays and how these might affect your plans. Again, contact me to discuss, but uh, we can briefly, I think I put in a, a slide here, which is just an example. This, I believe, is a commercial one zone. Um, if, if, if you download the uses of a zone, you can see here that it's got a table of uses. There's permit not required. Uh, permit required and prohibited uses. This table here is of the permit not required uses. As you can see, Arts and Crafts Centre, which is generally how art spaces are listed in the planning scheme, is listed as a section one use. So to do art stuff there, you don't necessarily need a permit, which can make things a lot easier. If it's a section two use where a permit is required, you'll need to apply for a planning permit, which can be a long process but it is totally doable and particularly with our assistance um there's a lot of boxes to tick and a lot of paperwork to get through but if if the space is right for the use then in all likelihood it will go through and it can be done and we're here to help so please hit us up um whoops i'm just trying to scroll back here yeah, so please come and talk to me if you're unsure about a property and I can help you out with some council, with the council lens. Um, and now negotiating the lease. When it comes to a commercial lease, it's um, particularly perhaps during this post COVID period where many places will be vacant, we assume, and property prices may drop. Um, different to what you might have experienced mostly with residential leases, uh, you may be coming in a position of power. They may be been trying to lease the place for six months or a couple months or be unsure of their um, their situation. So you might be coming at a position of power. They want to lease the space as much as you do. So you can negotiate here. You want to consider the state of the market, the state of the property, how long it's been available for, um, the terms. And when I say terms, it's a reference to uh, how long your lease is going to be. And often they're structured in ways that you would say, 
uh, three years by three by three by three, which would be a three years by three years by three years lease, which means you have a three year lease with set CPI rent increases between them and market reviews or some kind of review at terms and option for both parties to end at those terms. But um, essentially most landlords want a long-term lease. And if you get a longer, if you, and some tenants also want a long-term lease if they feel they have the capacity to be sustainable in one place. Um, the longer term lease you sign and the more fit out you're doing, the better position you are in general to ask for and negotiate your rent. So when I say negotiating, I mean, you can ask for a reduction from the rate that they're asking for. You can ask for an extended rent-free period. You, if I know of people who have signed a 15 year, a five by five by five year lease or 15 years and have had uh, six months rent-free, for example. And that can be a good way to say, if you're investing $40,000 into your fit out, you can look to recoup that by by charging a six by getting a six months free rent free period and charging your tenants for rent over that period and that rent can just go back to paying back the fit out and then you're breaking even by the time you need to start paying rent. Um, and things like outgoings and rates, you need to check the lease closely for whether you should be paying council rates. Uh, some landlords pass that on to tenants, some don't, and sometimes you can argue to have that scratch from your lease when it's on there. So do negotiate the lease. Um, and other things you want to check is prescribed uses. See if your use that you're planning to use the space for is listed as a prescribed use and whether if you are intending to sublet, uh, the, the landlord allows that, which normally it's pretty straightforward to get that on the lease. This is just an example of how leases look like as they might be structured here. And you can, uh, you, you, you can negotiate um, fixed terms at commencement date. Uh, and contracts and license agreements with your tenants. So uh, this is something that Aaron spoke about. Um, it's, it's really good to have written agreements with your tenants, whether you think you need to or not. It, you may quit down the line and someone might take your job or the tenants may change over. Um, but the, the contracts, if you're going to have a relaxed attitude, the contracts can reflect that, you know, they should be designed and reflect your management style, whether you're going to be hands on or hands off. And they can be as simple as essentially saying, just make, just clean the studio when you move out and fix any holes that you're making, et cetera. But it's, it's really good to have these things in writing and they don't have to be as onerous as you might think. There's a lot of existing RE contracts, which I think some REs in Melbourne are, are happy to share. Um, it's good to at least get some basic legal advice, hopefully through someone in your networks. Otherwise you can join NAVA for free legal advice. I think they give you one free legal advice session by joining and uh, they also can sort you out with public liability insurance. Um, speaking of insurance, you've got to get it. Public liability in particular that makes sure that you personally are not liable and that you're, that, um, that everything you're doing is above board with council as well. Um, and you wanna consider building and contents insurance as well. And you can build these costs into your tenant outgoings. Um, yeah, and from that, you wanna do a bit of risk management, which can help to reduce the cost of your public liability insurance by doing a comprehensive risk management plan. It sounds complicated, it's really not. Look up some templates online, ask me if you have any questions. Um, it's pretty easy to put together a risk management plan for your space and that can help insurers to have confidence that you know what you're doing um, and that they can insure you. Um, if you do need to go through the planning process, first things first, if you're considering setting up an art space and you don't know what the planning implications would be, contact me. Um, pretty sure my email's up here somewhere. If not, we'll add it. Um, and uh, we can talk about what things you need to consider with the planning permit. Um, I'll be your first port of call if you like, and we can see if you need a planning permit. If you do, we can set up a pre-application meeting with the planning team, and I'm happy to sit in that meeting with you as well. Um, typical planning processes that art spaces go through is change of use, as in uh, it may be an industrial zone and you want to have, use it as an arts and crafts center and, or a place of assembly, which is a place for events, um, which sometimes are not, uh, um, uh, sometimes not permit, not required uses. Um, 
on the zone. So a change of use planning permit will help you to get that use. Um, place of assembly is pretty common and a liquor license planning permit application, which I can also help you through the steps as well. And while it can be a long process, it's doable and it can be a really good way to raise revenue above the board. Um, and again, here we are with the commercial one zone. I think TCB, for example, is in a commercial one zone um, and it's pretty common in Morland. Um, yeah, and look, I know this all sounds really bureaucratic and uh, counselly a lot of, but don't be scared off. We're genuinely here to help, um, particularly the arts team. Don't be scared of asking us any thorny questions. We're, we're strictly here to help. Um, and it can be done. You know, if you persevere and jump through all these hoops, often you'll see that there's a lot of assistance you can get on the way and that a lot of hoops are there for a reason, not just to minimize risk, but also to connect you with groups of people that can help strengthen what you're doing. Particularly, um, the resources that Morland has to help directly is my time and the connections I have with other parts of council. Uh, the Morland Arts Grants, um, which we are currently revamping, maybe Ange, I'm not sure how much we're supposed to talk about this, but there should be some good news about them coming out in the next few months uh, with the new grants package. There's also business grants uh, through economic development. There's the Port Walls Arts Infrastructure Publication, the Arts Infrastructure Plan, and there's much more. So those are the key resources that we can offer. The different departments that you'll interact with, there's arts and economic development, they're strictly there to help you out. And then planning and local laws, they're the, more, the ones that you have to jump through some hoops for. But if, um, if you work with the arts and eco dev team, we can help make that as easy as possible and connect you with the right people. Um, and that's essentially a wrap on my presentation. Um, and I'll just be keen to take any questions if anyone has any. Um, maybe the other participants can jump on. I'll just go to this last slide here. Cool. Um, stop my screen share. Right, and I'd speak to Linda's question, who's asking, given the COVID economic situation or any time really, are there opportunities for council to have a program of liaising with empty shops, negotiating short-term leases, uh, pop-ups, exhibitions, et cetera, while they wait for regular paying tenants? It's a great idea, Linda. Um, I have started exploring those, um, exploring relationships with real, real estate agents. Um, it's tough for council to be the mediator of those agreements. So um, it, it actually, council being an officious uh, entity, often who real estate agents have a complicated relationship with um, because we're often the ones ensuring they uh, adhere to code and et cetera. Um, they might not necessarily want to agree in relationships with us and it would require really high levels of agreement um, for us as a, as a large institution. I'm, I'm working on it, but I would encourage people to reach out to real estate agents on their own as well, because often these agreements can be much easier just done a casual deal between a couple people than local government and real estate agents. Doing official deals with local government can be really complicated, particularly when it comes to leasing. We are looking at launching a project it's not locked in yet. We still need to get a few approvals in the next few months, which will be essentially paid residencies for artists in uh, paid short-term residencies for arts, paid short-term residencies for artists in vacant spaces around Morn. So keep your ears out for that one. But that's similar to what you're suggesting. I think your idea is a really good one, and um, it, I would suggest getting in touch with real estate um, agents. Um, and yeah, look, it's going to be really interesting to see how the commercial real estate landscape plays out in the next six months, 12 months, 24 months. We don't know. Um, no one knows. A lot of speculation out there, but I wouldn't be surprised if there is a big increase in vacancies and uh, a, a drop in price. And I hope that while I know that's going to be devastating for a lot of people, perhaps there's going to be opportunities to find cheaper art spaces as well. So maybe. Um, yeah. Uh, 
Is there any other questions specifically for my presentation? Feel free to put them into the, the Q and A. Um, while we've got some time left, um, wanted to float past Aaron. That's that question we talked about before. Is having an art space an inherently political thing? Do you see what you're doing as, as political, cultural, political, or how they interact? Um, yeah, I think it is. I think um, a group of people collectively making a space that benefits not only themselves, but a community around them to create a sort of environment where people can talk, and share work is inherently political. Um, I think the, the ethics of volunteering, sort of not um, holding capital gain or profit as like the relationship that you have with people um, creates a different way of thinking about what's important. Yeah, that's what I would say about that. Yeah. I agree. And I guess that's why council uh, gives grants to organization like yours. And, uh, you know, I always wish we had quadruple the grant funding, but it's because your, our job is to help the community and, you know, you're doing our job for us out there doing things for nonprofit reasons, you know, and um, that's why I think the arts uh, should always be funded by the government to a, a, a degree because it's some of the most important social cultural work that's been done. Uh, so thanks. <laughs> um, yeah, another question I wanted to ask for the panel as well. We're talking about boards. Um, Aaron, your, your board is essentially artists. Mm, yeah. Uh, yeah. We're all artists run. Um, uh, unlike TCB, I, it was really interesting to hear um, from TCB about how they sort of share the responsibilities around or at least make sure that everyone has uh, creative input and opportunity. Um, although we have very, very defined roles in our space, we do encourage everyone to yeah, get involved creatively as well. I think that's really, really important. Um, but yeah, we're all, we're all artists run. We all come from spaces. We've all been in studios before where it's been expensive or like neglected, uh, you know, dirty. We all had work that's been destroyed by holes in the roof. And, you know, um, so we've, yeah, we have that sort of experience of, of what it's like to be an artist and what we would like to ideally make for other artists in the future. Um, I just wanted to raise something that uh, it once we can all get back together, it's something that's been floated a bit in the future, but about uh, creating a network of Aries in Morn, for example, and um, that where we can meet and hang out together a little in the future and network, um, particularly, I guess, make it in a more a version of that. But we are looking at setting up whether it's a digital network of support for artist spaces in Morn. That's something that we're keen to explore in the future. And, Hope that everyone listening who's thinking of setting up an art space um, can, well, understands it, at least from council's end, super happy for people to reach out and ask any questions because it, this stuff is some of the hardest and biggest risk taking things uh, you can do. So we understand you need the support. It's funny, it's kind of like starting a business, but with the business is a big profit incentive and mm -hmm. you might make it rich <laughs> with <laughs> art spaces. The incentive is uh, just art, really, eh? You make a lot of friends. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we have a lot of good times and um, perhaps answer some existential questions. Mm. <laughs> but I think that's, I don't know, I guess that's what's cool about it and maybe that's also what's, like, what you were talking about earlier, Ed, of, like, it's so important, like, what's the, what's the value of things or... Um, yeah how do we use cities and spaces differently? How do we create the kind of communities like that we want to live in? And obviously like there's so many parts of that that are like about um, health, about mental health, about connection that like have a huge value to life. It's like, yeah. yeah. I don't know. I, I think it's like, it's kind of, I feel like sometimes it's strange when art has to justify itself economically when there's so many benefits 
that are actually just about the ways that we all want to live. Yeah, I uh, totally agree. And uh, I think, you know, uh, part of the, again, this is a personal opinion, not official Mullen City Council opinion, but part of the, you know, neoliberalization of the, of the city has become that physical spaces and the market, so to speak, are, are becoming one and the same thing and that the whole world is defined as the market, you know, and that's not a normal state of affairs, but that's a, you know, late capitalism, neoliberal way of looking at the world and having spaces that aren't in the market, so to speak, uh, helps to briefly redefine that and be like, oh, actually not everything I has to do has to be about making money. And maybe there is another way to live and think and um, be, you know, and that's probably the most important uh, question you can, or, or provocation you can offer someone is how to be in the world, you know? Um, yeah, so that's a bit of an esoteric note to end on. Anyone got any, <laughs> anyone else on the panel, anything to chime in? Any specific questions or anything? Um, no, no, I think you had a really great presentation. Uh, something, I guess, building on what you were saying in your presentation, um, I would definitely recommend having a dialogue with your landlord, um, you know, as predatory as they are sometimes, you you never know, you could have a nice one. Um, our, we are very lucky, our landlord, he owns lots of properties on the street. So that's, I think, part of the reason why he was very happy to have us there as an AR, as a ARI, um, is that it kind of, it looks good for him. Um, so, you know, you can create a sort of a, a mutually beneficial relationship with capitalists sometimes. Um, <laughs> yeah, and um, and you know, it is good what you guys, what you've done to that um, shopping strip. It's really brought it to life. Like my mum was staying at an Airbnb around the corner, and uh, she and dad went and bought a uh, bought a shirt, and we're talking about how cute your shop was, unrelated. And I was like, oh, we just gave those guys a grant a few months ago. So. Um, it's a genuine gift to to the people, you know, and to the streetscape. And um, same for TCB, you know, when when events are going on there, and I'm super. When when events are going on there, the streets come alive, and there's all these cool people around, and uh, I'm really excited to see the new interface with the street. Um, Is it true, Ed, that you write you wrote a positive Google review for TCB? <laughs> Thank you, Ed. Thanks, Matt. <laughs> true. Um, I'll have to do one for Pink Ember as well. Oh, thank you. <laughs> it might not be positive. I can't wait to see the new TC. <laughs> um, but yeah, I just like, I think what you were saying is really great, like to hit up. I know we did that with um, licensing for a commercial tenant and also with lots of like, we have a um, lawyer who's like also a supporter of the gallery, like just to kind of hit up people and other artists run spaces. Like we've had so many conversations with like Seventh and, mm. um, also with Kings, like people who run similar organisations often exactly like have the template or have negotiated with landlords or like you can really share information. And I, I think the other thing we've learned, like the power of being part of a group too, is that just to like call people and ask for things um, and that often either it's their job or it's in their interest, like whether that's like someone from ACCA or NGV or an artist run space or kind of a community um, another community organization like I, I feel like that's been really cool because you're not asking kind of for you you're asking for a group and so it's received the way you feel about it and the way it's received I just think it's like yeah people really want to support it and it's sort of like an ecology as well so just to like share knowledge and chat to people is really good yeah I agree and I guess that actually touches on what we we're speaking about before like you know uh the RE space, it's not really a competitive environment, you know, it, unlike the rest of the market where everyone is competing and people might not be so keen to share their secrets or documents or, or stuff with you. This is a supportive environment and the, the more of us, the better, so to speak, you know. Um, so, and that's one of the beauties of existing outside of the market framework is you can support each other and grow together and share things. Mm. Um, so, yeah, people shouldn't be scared of asking, in my opinion, um, yeah, of asking for, for things and for help.
Mm. Yeah. And really specific stuff. Yeah. Sorry. Like just, you know, we, for example, seventh with our commercial license, seventh gave us their template that had been developed sort of very recently with the lawyer that they were working with. So it meant that it was like much easier for us to adapt that. Um, and you need that kind of thing because to start from scratch, yeah, it, it becomes, it's, it's really onerous. Mm. Yeah, I was just going to say that knowledge is so hard earned sometimes. It's really, it's then really nice to kind of share it and pass yeah. it on. And yeah, yeah. You're saving someone 10 hours or something, you know. It's oh, a good... yeah. <laughs> uh, and the same goes, you know, for the other org I work for, Collingwood Art, Contemporary Arts Precincts. All our stuff is open source, our license agreements. If anyone wants them, we've had them written up by pro bono lawyers. So if people need studio license agreements, et cetera, we're, we're happy to share. Um, yeah, uh, anything else from anyone? Uh, and maybe you wanted to, I, I alluded to um, what you're working on a little before. I don't know how much you're allowed to speak about it. Yeah, um, we can't really announce anything too much other than to say, if you're not on our um, subscriber base on the Art Small and e-newsletter or if you don't follow our Facebook page, Art Small and Facebook page, I would suggest you do that now because we'll be making a very exciting announcement next week. So stay tuned for that um, and the rest I'll just have to leave as a bit of a secret. But um, I will take this opportunity just to thank everyone, all of our panellists today. Ed, thank you very much for running this session and for Aaron and Brian and Aaron for actually joining us and um, giving us some insight into what it's like to actually run these sorts of spaces. And um, it's been really lovely working with you over the last, oh, since I've been here, the last 18 months or so. Um, lovely to see the development of of your spaces and of your art form um, and you know despite what's going on at the moment the fact that you're actually still going and forging ahead and doing great stuff has been fantastic so thank you for joining us today um, i also want to shank, uh, thank cheryl and uh, gabriel for uh, being our interpreters today um, i know we had some difficulties in there i don't know that anyone saw them up there but um it's been fantastic having you both here so thank you very much for joining us and i also want to thank laura who is our design behind the scenes uh guru and has helped us with the zoom plat platform um and setting everything up today so thank you all very much for joining us today um there will be an email that goes out shortly it will have links to some of the documents that you um saw today and to a recording of this video. Um, it'll also have some other resources and things that will be useful to you. Um, and a very, very, very quick little survey, which I'd love for all of you to, um, to fill out for us. It'll take a minute or so. It's just an evaluation survey that allows us to know what's worked, what hasn't, and what our local artists might want to see in the future so that we can um, you know, put together some great material for you and help you in your arts practice. So thank you all very much. And I think we can sort of yeah. say goodbye. Can I just say uh, thanks very much to Angela, who has run a, put a lot of work into running this last Making It Mourned uh, series and puts in a lot of work for the Mourned Arts community behind the scenes, tweaking grant criteria and little things, fighting battles with management to get <laughs> wins for Mourned Artists. So um, uh, thanks, Angela, and congrats. My pleasure. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Cheers. Yeah.